Greetings, everybody. Welcome to an entirely new event, which uh, we did not have in season one of Ultimate Sensei. This is the Viewer Showcase. And um, this event is basically two events rolled into one. <laughs> there's, there's not any particular cohesion between the two uh, things that you're going to see today. Um, but nevertheless, we're rolling them into one uh, big event for today. Uh, it's going to be completely different and hopefully interesting. So let me flash up a card for you so those of you who prefer to read over listening can sort of hear along uh, as I explain today's format. Uh, the first part of today's format is going to be a series of 10-minute lessons. So each of the students is going to have the opportunity to come on and provide a lesson for all of you for 10 minutes. Um, it could be about anything uh, that they've learned or you know thought about or explored chess-wise during the course of Ultimate Sensei Season 2. So it's not going to be you know a book they read seven years ago unless for some reason they've been thinking about it again this, this past month or two. Um, but yeah, they'll each get to do a lesson. Uh, that lesson will be judged by me. Um, I didn't have the time, resources, money to bring in a huge, uh, you know, teaching, judging panel. Um, so it's just going to be done by me. The scoring today is going to be, you know, a little bit casual and the students uh, know that. We have um, $600 in prizes, as you can see on the side, that's going to be allocated to teams based on uh, individual performances today. Um, and, you know, I could have spent all that money just on bringing in judges. So I'd rather give it to the students and uh, do the work myself or, or the teams. You know, they could, they could elect to send it to their, uh, to their coaches. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I will judge uh, their lesson on a scale of one to five points. Um, and that is the first thing. They'll probably mostly be screen sharing something for you all to see and uh, they all knew about this and were able to prepare their lessons it's not just sort of like hey dripman welcome to today's show uh could you just teach the people something <laughs> so um how will i judge the lesson is a pretty good question i could maybe go into that for about 15 seconds now and then maybe more later on today but um you know i've spent a lot of time teaching a lot of time watching lessons a lot of time watching other teachers and uh, I'll be judging it on a mix of, you know, how well I think they understand what they're trying to teach and uh, how likely people watching are to understand it afterwards if they didn't know about it already. So, for example, uh, I see BG Cube in chat who's one of who's not one of the students. So if uh, BG Cube watches a lesson from Morphe Fan, I'm going to be imagining in my head how well is BG Cube likely to be understanding and retaining uh, the material that, that Morphe fan presents to him. So it's going to sort of vaguely be in that in that direction. Um, and then the second thing that we're going to have today, and we'll have more time to get into that maybe, but this format is kind of simpler. It's a two-game exhibition match. The players will be playing two-game matches against each other in two weeks when we get to the Ultimate Sensei finale. The uh, difference will be that then there will be uh, a tie break. A match won't be able to end 1-1. Today, a match can end 1-1. And I think we've got another show at 3 o'clock. So, you know, the matches have to end <laughs> at 3 o'clock. I think Costa is doing commentary on the Pan Ams today, and we all want to watch that. So there will be a two-game exhibition match. If it ends tied, that's fine. The time control will be 15 plus 5, just like in the draft tournament and just like in the finale in two weeks. And the students uh, will just score points in that match equal to the points they score in the games in that match. Um so if they tie a match one to one, each student will get a point. And if a student wins a match um, two to zero, they will get two points. Um, and I'll add that to their lesson score. Um, and as usually happens with like lesson scoring, like realistically, the lessons are more likely to be, you know, from two to five than from one to five. One would really be, you know, I mean, the student would sort of have not shown up to give the lesson or something like that. So I think that although one seems to be worth five points and the other seems to be worth two, it'll be a similar spread. It'll work out somewhat, you know. Um, this event sort of, 
you know, showcases more of the students learning and a little bit less the competitive side. So the scoring is not as mathematically clear as in like a tournament event. But um, I've prepared the students for that and I'm expecting minimum griping on that subject. So that is our format today. Um, I hope you are all ready because the instruction is going to start right now. So, um, you know, if you think you've got something to learn from these people, you can take out uh, your, your thinking caps or uh, a pen and pad to take some notes. And uh, we will be getting into uh, the lessons right away. So let me introduce you to uh, Morphe Fan, if I can pull this up correctly. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Um, greetings, Lars. Welcome. Good. Nice to have you here on yep. uh, the dojo. And um, you were randomly selected to go first. I hope there's not any major like advantage or disadvantage for going first or last. But I picked the names quite randomly. Okay, sounds good to me. Um, am I good to start whenever? You, you are good to why. start whenever. We can see you and hear you chat. If you cannot see. Or here, <clears throat> Lars, let let me know, and I'll try to make adjustments on the fly. All right. So uh, I'm Lars, as you all know, and I'm here to teach a lesson on something that Andrus and I have been talking about quite a bit, actually, uh, as this competition's gone on. Um, and that's sort of about the need for perseverance and, uh, I guess, a lack of giving up when in a lost position. Um, this is something that actually arose right out of my first, first out of the first tournament um, when I was playing Blue Jay. Actually, um, when we were doing the the analysis, the post game analysis, and I had made this e5 move, and I made a comment. I knew instantly, actually, that it was a blunder because I like I immediately saw like the the tactical refutation after I played it. And I mean, it's such an obvious obvious blunder. But uh, my comment to Andrews at the time was, I just about hit the resign button, and it's very common for me. Um, to resign early in games. Uh, I didn't in this tournament because at the end of the day, I wanted to show that I had like a fighting mentality and I wanted to be picked. So I played on and I managed to uh, win this game in the end. So I guess the first thing that I learned from this is uh, we don't want to give up and we need to start looking for chances to turn a game around. And I actually didn't play that game, this game with the attitude that I could turn it around. Actually, I just sort of got lucky and my opponent either finger slipped or he just missed a tactic or missed that his queen would have been checked and I turned the game around. There's not a whole lot to learn from this uh, other than we need to change our attitude and we need to approach the game in a different way. So I'm gonna actually now go to a game I played over the board in December um and it was played in classical time controls and this was a game i played uh it would have been two two to three weeks ago and actually uh it's just sort of my standard nimzo indian that i played my f3 nimzo indian and i immediately blow like the opening that i always play and here i should have played d5 so immediately i am in a game where I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and it's it was really important for me at this point because queen a5 came and I had no idea uh, how to approach this situation. I, I always play d5. I had no idea how to, how to think about this. And I started like digging deep and just sort of trying to remember what I understand about when a queen comes to a5 in Nimzo Indian structures. And in a lot of the structures I end up playing, we sometimes sacrifice the pawn on or the pawn on c3, and we try to gain, gain tempi. Um, so uh, this was uh, something we ended up talking about after after the fact as well. I've talked with Andres about this game, but the plan that I came up with, because essentially I sat here for about five to ten minutes trying to figure out what I was going to do to right the wrong, because I had no idea what I was doing at this point. And actually, I just sort of decided that I was going to sacrifice this pawn and try to play for getting some sort of initiative, getting my pieces out, and, uh, you know, uh, playing for practical chances. Uh, practical chances, uh, in this case, probably weren't needed. Uh, I think the, the engine-suggested move is just this, which I, I feel is really lame. It's not my style of play. 
So I didn't play that. Uh, I played I played E3, and with the attitude that I was going to sac sacrifice this pawn um, on C3, I was going to play Bishop D2 with a Tempe, and the, we're going to have all, all my pieces are going to start coming out with some energy. And I was going to make up for the fact that I'm down a pawn. This isn't the engine best move, but I think from a practical standpoint, it ended up working out okay for me. Um, a suggestion that Andrus had made actually was to just play d5 here. And again, with the same idea, we're sacrificing this pawn and we're going to, we're, we're, we may even sacrifice the c4 pawn as well, because what we're going to do is we're going to play bishop d2, we're going to play e4, and everything is coming out. Uh, with a lot of energy, and we're going to have at least a practical chance to build up an attack and, and kick the queen around a whole bunch. So I guess what's what's important to understand is that when things are going wrong for us, we don't just you know give up. We we try to find a different way to think about the position. We try to find we 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 play chess. We're not we we don't quit on the spot. We're going to fight for for the win. And in this game, um, my opponent ends up getting kicked around quite a bit. Uh, the knight comes out to e2, my bishop comes out to f4, you see the queen is getting kicked around all over the place. Yes, this comes with a check backwards, but uh, I have this, this another attack on the queen. And at this point, actually, uh, I just want to talk about this. This pawn cannot be taken, because if this pawn is taken, the rook can come and we now have an attack on the king coming. So this was a, a, another little piece of bait that we had in the position. Um, uh, pardon me, I just lost my train of thought. So yes, um, at this point, when I played bishop f4, there's also this square here, and I'm like a really big fan of putting my pieces on like either the d3 or the d6 square. It's actually something Paul Morphy did. <laughs> um, I've seen it in a few of his games. It's, it's an amazing thing, but it essentially restricts development, and we will see throughout this game uh, that the development of black is restricted and their ability to put their pieces on the best squares is highly restricted. And even though my opening is completely blown and I'm down a bunch of pawns, I now have at least a chance to play a game of chess. And again, this, this queen check comes, we move the king to f2, we're just trying to get all of our, our king to safety and all of our pieces out. And ultimately, um, you'll see that this becomes a really wild, a really chaotic game. It's a huge mess. And um, we end up drawing the position. But uh, there is one other instructive moment I wanted to mention in this game. And it's just that um, I didn't really have to accept the draw here, I don't believe. There, are, There's still an opportunity, actually. Um, so one of the instructive things that Andrews had pointed out to me is that Black really has no way to improve its pieces at this point. I have a sp pretty clear space advantage. Um, there's no real real way, if he doesn't accept the draw here, if Black chooses to play on, there's no real way to get their pieces out and actually improve it. And White actually, even though I have a knight on f2, a bishop on c1, and a rook on h1, I can play h4, I can get all my pieces out still, and I can still play for practical chances where Black has sort of reached their maximum potential because there's nowhere to actually put these pieces right now. So I guess from the standpoint is, even though everything went wrong right from move one or move five, I guess, I was able to turn this game around and actually uh, pull out a draw. And this was actually against a 1900 over the board. So I was playing up at the time. Um, and that's just sort of something we talked about is like trying to find uh, ways to find practical chances in positions uh, when you've blown it. And then I just have one final game that I'd like to talk about. Um, Again, this was played over the board uh, here in Calgary, and it was in a, a another rated game, uh, another classical game. And uh, this is just a, a position that I'm sure if we took 30 seconds and if you just thought about this position, I'm pretty sure you could tell me who was winning this game based on that. Um, so I'll give you 30 seconds. You tell me who is who's winning. <laughs> it's not really difficult to figure out who's winning in this position. Um, so I guess if you were to turn the engine on at this point, it would probably give you like an evaluation of like plus six, plus seven <laughs> um, for white. Uh, as you can see, like there's a death star, as I like to call it, of pieces that are all here. We have a pass pawn that's coming down the board. Um, my, my position here is completely blown. So it was at this point where I 
decided that if I'm going to try to play for practical chances, the only thing that I could see that was weak on the board was the king is by itself. Now, objectively, this position is totally losing, and it doesn't matter what I play. If I can, I can sit and I can let my opponent beat me to death, or I can try uh, to play for practical chances. And um, I'd like you to ask yourself what you would play in this position. I'll give you 15 seconds. Again, we're just looking for some way to attack this king. And um, because we're time constrained, I'm not going to give you a whole lot of time to think about it. Um, so now if we're going to continue on, uh, I will tell you what I played. I started hurling pawns down the board because the only practical chance that you have is if you're going to open this king up. And there might, there's also a psychological aspect when, you know, humans don't play like computers, they play like humans. So when they see things coming at them, they start worrying about the things coming at them. And this is, again, something that I've learned from, you know, watching Andrew's stream, I've watched and I've, I've learned from talking with him. We're going for attacks uh, when we're down and, and we're, we're losing. Um, the engine suggests trading off all my pieces and accepting the fact that I've lost this game. That's not how I play, that's not how I think. So instead I played the h5 to just try to uh, just try to provoke the king side and, uh, and open things up. And my opponent played h4, and actually I'm just going to switch over to the game. Um, I'll tell you right now that even though white is completely winning here, they go on to lose this game. So h4 or h5 comes h4, and then again I play a, a, mo a move that is worse than the engine suggested move, which is to trade off all my pieces. Again, trading the knight, I play the immediately awfully losing g5. But at the end of the day, this is the only chance that we have is opening up the opening up the king, and my opponent in this position uh, completely froze. They had 20 minutes on the clock. They spent 10 minutes. Now this is a move that. <clears throat> Um, if you are going to, I think, if you're going to find the refutation of this move, you're going to find it in 30 seconds, which is just to take the pawn. And um, when we analyzed the game afterwards, Fide Master Dale Hazel was walking around, and he was looking at our board when we were analyzing it. And he's just like, like, why didn't White take the pawn? It was so immediately obvious to him. But psychologically, um, this h5 move had given pause to my opponent, and then the g5 move just completely froze him. And I go on to win this game um i think it was with either mate and one or the queen has to be given up to avoid it and that's because my opponent doesn't find the right refutation to this move they play knight e4 instead of just taking the pawn um and all of a sudden you can see like that death star is broken up pieces are flying all over the board there's now i'm, I'm getting tempe the king is opened up and we make this trade knight for bishop trade Looks great, I guess, but now everything around the White King is open, and I've gone from being completely lost to at least having a chance to draw this game. So I guess what we need to learn and what I've learned from Andrus in this is that if I'm like in a lost position, it's not immediately resignable. There's always still chances. You just have to think about them, and you have to realize that your opponent is not the computer. They are not Gary Kasparov, as he likes to say. You have to realize that there's always a chance to turn things around. And I guess that's sort of uh, the basis of my lesson today. I just wanted to talk about perseverance and, and uh, fighting on, even though things look completely hopeless. All right. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Morphe fan. Wonderful. <laughs> um, next up, we have uh, Falk. Welcome back, everybody, to our viewer showcase. Um, sorry, let me switch the name here. Um, but I introduce you to Falk, um, uh, representing Team Kostya. And uh, Falk is going to uh, take over now and give the next lesson. So go for it. Uh, yeah. Hey, everybody. Um, I mean, um, let, let me say it like ahead of um, time, like um, I have everything in, in a leech chest study, so no one has to take any notes, I guess. And I can share it afterwards. <laughs> so yeah, um, in like the last like five weeks or so, I spent a lot of time um, working on sh uh, chess structures that arise from like the openings that I play. And that's why like today's, like my lesson today is about the 
Maroxi structure. Um, it's basically the structure you guys can see on, on the screen right now. Um, it's usually called the Maroxi bind, and it's, I mean, it's characterized by um, white having pawns on c4 and e4, and white has this huge um, central control over the light squares and a lot of, uh, and a lot of space in the position. Um, and whereas um, black has uh, traded his uh, c pawn for the d pawn of white. And yeah, um, just in general, we can already see that white has like this huge space advantage. And one move which um, black would like to get in, in the Sicilian usually is this, um, give me some more, like this is this d5 break. And as we can see, since white has this control and usually white also has a knight on c3, um, this d5 break is just uh, not going to happen in the, Mar in the Maroxi bind. And yeah, so, they're like two different, I mean, still like a lot of people play this from the black side and a lot of people play this from the white, from the white side. Um, today, I wanted to focus more a bit on uh, like a few of white's plans and, ide and ideas. And yeah, um, in, in general, since like for black, since he has less space, he wants to trade, uh, he wants to trade pieces. Uh, it's very logical because um, if you look at the board, black only basically has uh, three ranks um, that he can offer to his own pieces. and the more pieces you have, uh, the less, uh, the more clutter it's going to get. So you just want to trade off pieces and um, make sure you have like fewer pieces on the board that you can put on better squares. And yeah, um, usually black goes for um, like black's play is usually focused either on the queen side, and he um, like combined with like the pawn break of a6 b5, or he can focus in some lines on um, an f pawn break and focus play on the king side. Uh, today we will see um, a plan where it was um, a, where Black executed the plan on the queen side, and uh, yeah, White um, on the on the other hand has to like White's goal is since he has so much space to work with, is to constrict um, Black's play and plans. So, for example, if we look at this a6 b5 break, um, a very typical thing you will see in a, in a lot of those Maroxi structures is that White plays. Um, b3 and a4 because it like offers more control of this b5 square and um with a knight on c3 you have like uh, this uh, supreme control over the position and um yeah white's plan is also usually um involving some idea of like f4 f5 um to gain more space and to sometimes um, break on the king side and usually black um in the, those kind of positions places a bishop on e6 so it's also like a nice bonus if you can kick the bishop or uh, yeah, force it to go to a square. And yeah, let me see. Uh... Okay, so today we will see uh, a game from Peter Lecko against uh, Ivanchuk. They played a rapid game in um, 2007, and that's what I'm going to show you guys. Um, the Maroxi bind can occur from like a bunch of different openings, like the King's Indian, I don't know, the Accelerated Dragon, the English. It can also happen in like reverse colors if you have like a re reverse Sicilian. And yeah, this is like the most typical move order to reach at this position. And oops. Uh, and already here, um, I mean, we're not going to focus too much on the opening, but um, Peter Leko played uh, Bishop E2 here. Another move that's kind of funny nowadays, it's, um, it's not, not super popular, but it's an idea. It's like, why can also go Knight C2 already? Like we see that White already tries to, um, White could already try to um, counteract Black's plan of trading pieces, right? By just ducking the, the knight away and like not offering this um, piece trade. Um, but yeah, instead he, here he went uh, bishop e2. So now we get this typical exchange of knights in the accelerated dragon because Black again wants to get rid of the pieces. And, and then we get a few more moves in. Now we reach like this very typical position um, in this Maroxi bind structure. Yeah, again, white has all those, um, uh, has, has all this control over the light squares. And um, yeah, black has like already managed to get one, uh, get rid, so to say, of one knight. And um, here, like something which may seem counterintuitive is like in this kind of, uh, in this type of position, black also often wants to get rid of, um, get rid of the uh, dark square bishop. And uh, yeah, that's uh, what we're going to see in this game too. Uh, yeah, he played, uh, he eventually played here queen a5, which um, now that's not the most popular plan, 
usually people go for stuff um, which involves a5 uh, and then like a4 to um, counteract the um, pawn formation we saw earlier with uh, a4 and b3 like to um, get in this um, queen side push uh, earlier and to be able to put up more pressure without like being able to stop it and uh, yeah so in this game we saw this um, uh, queen a5 move which is also like a very typical move um, nothing is wrong with it really uh, castle c just develops normally bishop e6 and now we can see um like starting to already put pressure on the c file or on the c pawn so white usually plays uh, b3 in those positions and he brings uh, the f rook over to c8 which might seem a bit counterintuitive like some people or I, i've at first thought oh why doesn't he bring over the a rook um again usually what you see is here the plan is to go a th a6 b5 and then you open up the a file so you kind of want to, your rook to already be on a8 right like um if you put the rook to c8 right now the a rook then you would put it away from the potentially open a file later on so yeah we get this um uh yeah this um rook to c8 and peter leko just played rook um, fc1 and again this is like still a very typical and normal position for this opening and here Ivancho played um kind of an interesting move which looks like it uh, plays according to black's plans right he forces um, an exchange of pieces um but again um here he already might have had like better chances if uh he goes um for the more concrete idea of a6 b5 and like um bringing the rook to b8 first and then pushing the pawn because otherwise he might run into some problems which we will see in the game um yeah, so here uh, he played uh, Ivanchuk played knight g4 and as, as I said th this forces an exchange of minor pieces so it's kind of what like Black is like following the original idea of getting rid of the pieces and now we see um very nice move by Peter Leko um here he, um, if you uh, look a bit at the position you will notice that um I mean at first this dark square bishop of white might seem really strong because um, all the pawns are on the light squares and um uh, yeah so why would you uh, exchange it but um after it, after like um exchanging the the bishops uh, here um we see that um we kind of have like a middle game where white has like this super superior minor piece because um i mean <laughs> where is this bishop even going to go like the usual square is like bishop e6 here or he might have some ideas of bishop um d7 to c6 but it's also like kind of counterintuitive since he already places rooks on the queen side and he would want to push this uh, with a6 b5 so it's a bit um so white has definitely definitely got the better minor piece in this case and uh, uh yeah and we can now see that again um like from in the following move moves you will see that a lot of white's play um really arose around the b5 square and like controlling it uh, so yeah we see a uh, bishop e6 like trying to improve the bishop well it wasn't doing much on uh, g4 and now you place rook um a b1 uh falk you have yeah. another two minutes okay oh sorry uh, <laughs> i didn't miss the time uh, uh yeah so um maybe what one point here is um that um so in the game um Ivan should play at a6 but here he had this very nice idea of queen a3 again blockading this idea that we saw earlier with um a4 like to prevent white from re reaching the structure which um he kind of missed and yeah he played a6 and uh, then peter leko get this uh, gets this a4 i am moving so we can see that he kind of uh, almost achieved what we looked at earlier right it's, it's only missing like f4 and then he has like all the space and a very solid structure but it's like super difficult for white to achieve anything and uh, yeah here uh, we have some momos and here he made like um small in um like a, uh, a mistake uh, in a sense because now white has uh, now black has this um tactical shot if you want to say so like what black should do in those positions is like basically on every move you kind of have to figure out if you can make b5 work because otherwise you're just going to be worse and here he had like um, a nice tactical shot with b5 because um after all the pawns are gone the queen and uh, rook are aligned for a skewer so Actually, it's almost happened here and then we would have this so this is like 
this would be equalizing for um for black uh, yeah here you play rook c5 and eventually um after a few more moves uh it was a rapper game so mistakes are bound to happen uh he kind of got um uh, his rook trapped and put on a, on a um, bad square so now like this b5 move is never going to happen and basically um black is just worse and yeah um here yeah, after some moves uh, um he made the mistake of um getting the rook trapped like now um uh like he i guess he missed 95 so here um black has a take and now the rook is kind of trapped trapped and yeah this is basically just game over now uh, after a few moves uh it was uh, he, he resigned i think yeah, he resigned um because now after um queen f4 check king h1 this is like uh just lost yeah so yeah, what i kind of wanted to to mention was that uh, it's a nice idea to know this kind of structure in the Maroxy from the white side and it's important to play with space and be aware of this uh 95 idea and yeah i hope i could uh, get some points across yeah thank you very much Falk. um good good recap at the end there about um about what we were supposed to get out of the lesson. Oh yeah, um, I can also share the lead chess study if anyone actually wants to look at this. Excellent. Uh, I don't chat. know if you can, uh, I don't know oh, if you're gonna uh, be allowed to send uh, the link. I can't, yeah, I can't. But if you uh, whisper it to uh, maybe Kostya or Hoki or, or Mitch, maybe Ahmad, uh, sure. we'd be able to post it for you. Um, and now we're gonna make a little switch over to Seth. So, I think so. Um, Bye, everybody. I've definitely heard this comment from, say, David watching my games and dojo tournaments and stuff, is that I will sometimes have a tendency just like to play on general principle, sort of generally, as David would say. And um, one thing I could help is just is finding the moments to find concrete calculation. And one of the my problems is that calculation is probably not my strength. So um, our team me and ty my teammate been working on calculation ty's going to talk more about some of his work with um calculating for uh strategic purposes and when it's important to calculate and i'm going to just share a technique that matt has shared with me about calculating and that is called uh, the stepping stones technique um, is the name for it matt uh read this from agard who Yaakov Agard, who got the name um, and the concept from uh, Jonathan Tisdall's Improve Your Chess Now uh, book. So um, I'll just tell you that's where it comes from. And the basic idea here is that we want to find the position we are going to do. Oh, I should have said I meant to introduce it. All right. So there's a position on the screen. This is a cal This is a puzzle. It's white to play and win. So while you're talking. We're gonna we're gonna use this technique on this puzzle. Um, if you get it in the chat, uh, you know, write it down, keep it to yourself, let other people have a chance at it. Um, and I'm gonna kind of show you. This was something that came up in my regular tactical exercise that I do, and I'm gonna show you kind of how I was able to apply this new technique to solve kind of a difficult puzzle for me. All right, so um, you want to find the position. So if you're calculating multiple lines. You, the idea of the stepping stones is to pick a step that has the most critical point in your calculation and fix that position in your mind. So this is a bit of an exercise in visualization, all right? And then you want to fix that position in your mind. So instead of it now being, say, three ply deep or whatever, this is the new position from which you are searching for your new candidate moves. Um, hopefully, hoping this is everyone's following so far. Um, so for instance, here we have a puzzle, white to play and win. All right, so when I look at this, so when you look at this puzzle, you, you, you know, like anything, you make your candidate moves. And well, first you survey the position, you'll notice white is down uh, a piece, a minor piece and a rook. So significant material deficit. Um, if they have anything, we're probably looking for an attack on the king here. And so immediately, your first candidate move has to be the um, cool sacrifice queen f7. So that's what you, so when I was doing the puzzle, I um, 
I knew like queen f7, and I knew since it was a puzzle was probably the solution. However, I was working on calculating, so I was uh, I was trying to you know really visualize the whole thing. Another thing I've been working on, you know, writing down the lines, making sure I I'm making I'm. I'm taking care of all the possibilities in my calculation being thorough. Um, and also I was, I've now, um, and we want to think of this as a technique that we can apply to our own games. So um, you want to sort of treat it like the puzzle, like a position in a game, or as I like to say now, uh, treat every puzzle as if David Proust gave it to you. So um, if you saw the tactics challenge, you'll get that. Um, so, uh, so, um, so, so queen f7 is the first most obvious thing we need to check. And then there's a series of pretty forced moves after that. So if you can visualize for yourselves, I don't want to put it on the board yet. Maybe I'll do, do the arrow thing. All right. Queen f7. King f7 is forced. Then um, we have bishop e6. Check. All right. And um, king f6. Only move for black. Then we have this e5 check, which looks really promising and is because if knight takes or pawn takes your most natural responses, if you can see in your head, maybe give you a few seconds, what is, there's a mate and one on the board right here. So I'll leave that for, for the people for a sec. You know, this would be like the pause your video moment. Um, all right. And, uh, so 94 here, if you found it in those few seconds, good job. Uh, 94 would be checkmate if they play either of these captures. All right, so I'm going to take those arrows off. So the line we need to calculate now is queen takes f7, king takes f7, bishop e6. I'm just putting this back on the board for the arrows. e5, and the only move black has to avoid getting mated is king takes e5 immediately made it i should say um all right so this now would be the stepping stone position because after this we know our principles of like if we're attacking the king we want to keep attacking we want to keep gain tempo but now we have a few so that's gotten us to this force sequence but now we have um a situation where we have a few candidates all right so Give like uh, 30 seconds. I got a little timer here. 30 seconds and see um, what you can come up with. This is really the critical position if you want to solve this puzzle. So in your minds, we should have a uh, the king on e5. The bishop that's on h3 has gone to e6. Uh, and the pawn on e4 is now off the board. Otherwise, we have the position in front of us, unless I forgot something. All right, there's my timer going off. All right, so some of your candidate moves here, you might have considered F4 check. I know this was what was going on in my mind. F4 check um, was like the most obvious to me. But as I was calculating it, well, if the, if the king tries to go back to F6, we got mate in one. However, there's this flying the ointment, no matter which checks you try, f4 or bishop f4, there's this king d4 move. All right, I'm gonna take the arrows off. Okay, so let's put let's put it on the board now. All right, this is all pretty forced. All right, and now I'm thinking like, I wanna play king f4 or bishop f4. Now, Bishop f4 is not my first choice because the bishop is doing a good job of restricting the king where it's at. But, um, oh, and then also, of course, rook e1. And every time black's only move is king d4. And so after spending several minutes of looking at this and like not ever getting the king, he always got away, just like he had one square every time. He'd run to the other side to the a file usually, and then I couldn't mate him. Um, we know we're playing for mate. So at this point, I'm getting desperate. I need to find one more candidate move. I need to cut the king off. And if you have this position fixed in your mind, you can find the move, or at least I could. Otherwise, no chance. All right. And um, I give another, 
have 30 seconds since we're on time constraint here. Uh, anyone thinks, so I just, there's, I've told you the problem is that the king is running to d4. So how do we stop him from doing that? Uh, my timer failed here, but a few more seconds on that. Um, and if you think about it, and if you if you spend exhaustively, oh, there it goes. Oops, sorry. All right. Um, if you thought about this exhaustive, if you like I did, and you really looked at all the checks, the king always got away. You find the solution here, which is rook d1. This beautiful move here, just cutting off the king, and black is helpless. There's no move here. Now we can execute our plan of of uh, get back to our forcing moves. There's nothing here, so um, at this point. Um, uh, at this point, um, the best move for black is to go back to f6, and that leads to the sequence. Now we're back to a nice force sequence. Knight e4, king e5. Um, better remember it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh no. Uh, yeah, I wrote down the first moves thinking I would remember this part, but, uh, um, time. Nobody will ever know the answer to the puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. It's but Yeah. So Bishop F4 and then F3 is checkmate on the board. Um, the only other try here is if, and if they don't play King F6, they do something else. We have F4 check and, um, followed by the knight E4 mate. That was the problem before. So let's just say they play some nothing move. Cause you know, there's no move that they can make to make room for the king. So I'll just finally wrap up the puzzle here. This is me. All right. So at that point, right. So um, using the stepping stones method, this is uh, a puzzle that like, if you're in puzzle world, maybe you just start with King F7 and you follow it. And then maybe you get to the position and then you maybe find the move at the critical point. But in a game, we don't have that luxury. So the reason this technique is good is for practical calculation, right? You want to play something in a game, and um, my partner is going to talk more about that later, right? And you might, and one of the problems I've had oftentimes is I will dismiss something sort of out of hand because at one point um, it looks unfeasible or undesirable, and oftentimes. You know, they say always go one deeper. Well, sometimes you need to stop in a position and uh, and fix that position and uh, and try to um, and, and then then the solution becomes then you have a new set of candidate moves. This becomes a more feasible task than trying to keep it all from the beginning in your mind, having to recalculate. And in a game, of course, we're constrained by time. So for practical purposes, this is a good time to maybe improve your calculation efficiency, which is definitely something I need to work on. Um, so in conclusion, I hope you had, this is just one, one thing you can try um, to improve your chess and your calculation. One technique, here is an example in a, in a puzzle. This actually came from a game that's very hard to find um, on the internet, but uh, it actually happened. So this is not just in puzzle world, right? And, um, and, and hopefully you have gained something that you can apply to your own chess and, and use to, because um, if you're like me, calculation is like, is, is your first and second priority as a chess improver that she gave me initially, which I was miraculously able to solve without this method, but we'll apply the method to it. So let's just first look at the position, then we'll come back to this. If I can switch the windows. So it's white to play here. 
And just making some general observations about the position, we might note that the king's safety is about pretty safe for both sides. The material is even. We might notice that white has pretty good activity of their pieces. We have these doubled rooks on the C file pressuring the C6 pawn. And we have centralized pieces. Well, both sides kind of have centralized pieces. But white has this problem rook in the corner. It's undefended. It's undeveloped. And they also have this c6 pawn being pinned because the pressure along the c file. So those are just kind of some observations. Um, and let's just kind of take a look at what Sasha recommends for these types of planning positions. So first is, does the opponent have any threats or scary ideas? And typically in these kind of educational positions, you're not going to be given one where you have to first parry a threat and then execute a plan, but you might. And it's always good to be worth like looking at the opponent's ideas and pluses in the position. So if we kind of go back to the position and take a peek over here, like I don't think black has anything fantastic going on, but they also don't really have any weak squares with this pawn structure being totally fine, even though they played F6, you know, like they're totally okay. Maybe this D6 square is weak or something, but not really. We can't, we can't really do anything about it right now. Um, they don't, have any pressure going you know they don't seem like they have a lot going on what they do have is you know maybe they're going to just play rook, c, rook a to c8 and then maybe they'll play c5 or they'll play rook here and do this and if we give black enough time i feel like they're just going to sort their pieces out and be totally fine so that's maybe some observations that we can make about the position then sasha's recommendations here are to look to see do we have any regroups do we have any exchanges or do we have any pawn moves? So regroups would be re-coordinating your pieces, finding new homes for them. Do we have an inactive piece that we need to improve? Is there an outpost that we need to go stick a piece on? Things like that, trying to better our position. Um, are there any exchanges for us to make that are beneficial? So these exchanges, you know, there's lots of reasons to exchange. Maybe you're trading off one of their defenders. Maybe you're trading off your bad bishop for their good bishop. Maybe you're trading off an inactive piece of yours for an active piece of theirs. Maybe these trades open up lines or weaken their king. Lots of reasons to make exchanges, but it's something to look for in these positions. And then also look for pawn moves. So, um, and again, many reasons for pawn moves. Maybe it's gaining space. Maybe it's controlling a square. Maybe it's opening a line, because if you can, you know, not in this position, but if perhaps there was, you know, a pawn here, maybe you have to imagine the position looking different, but you could maybe push the pawn up a square, finding a home for your knight. So looking to open lines, or maybe there's a bishop here, you could do this, and it would open the bishop along this diagonal. Many reasons, but those are the things to look at. And again, they were regrouping, exchanges, and pawn moves. So now we're gonna kind of look at this position with this framework, and it might help us find what is considered the best move, or at least the move played in the model game here. Because sometimes these positions are overwhelming. We have probably, you know, 30 legal moves or something. So we have to figure out what to do. Let's look at regrouping first. So first, these rooks are probably almost ideally placed. It doubled on the C file, pressuring here. The queen is in the center, pretty good. The knight is not really doing much here. I mean, it's okay. But we could consider regrouping it over to F4, pressuring the E6 pawn. But that might just prompt black to fix their problem rook and give it a job. Because currently it has no job on A8, but rook, A, rook to E8 gives it a job at least. So I don't think that this is typically a position for regrouping. I've seen more positions where it's a bit more closed and maybe you can go maneuver a knight to a weak square is a common regrouping kind of idea in some of these positions. Um, but like I said, black doesn't have any real weak squares for us to exploit. Um, pawn moves here. We don't have any pawn moves that are gonna activate pieces. We do have like b4, a4, gaining some space. We have f3. These are pawn moves that we could consider. But 
in response to these, I imagine that Black would have just fix their rook with rook A to C8 or rook E8 or something, you know, um, kind of, if we give Black time, I think they're gonna be able to sort their pieces out. So then we're kind of left with exchanges as the only other thing in this model to look for. And I guess I wanna say first here, like when I have a position like this, like without this model, I might think, okay, white's better. White's slightly better. White needs to improve and keep the gas up, like add more fuel to the fire if they want to like use their advantage. So the move that's actually played here was very surprising and not the first thing that crossed my mind because well, I guess I'll, I'll just spoil it here. Uh, let's say it this way. If we want to do an exchange, what can we exchange here? Like, we can't really trade any of these rooks. We can't really force a knight trade. The only thing we could really offer is a queen trade. And to me, when we're up in a slight position, it's not my first thought to be like, hey, let's trade queens. A, it's not my first thought to trade, period. And B, it's not my first thought to trade queens because we're losing so much of the power on the board, especially like a centralized queen. But this is actually a very forcing move, and I'll look through some of these lines here, and it's the move we're going to play. But we might also notice that if you just imagine the position without the queens on the board, the c6 pawn is just hanging. Um, the queen is probably one of their prime defenders for the black side. It's defending all these things in the center kind of tying their position together. So if it was gone, we would still have this pressure on the C file. We would still be able to reroute this knight. Um, so looking at the move, and I'll stick it on the board now, um, it's a very forcing move because the queen can't move along this diagonal because they hang a rook. And queen, queen here just falls into E4. And now like this is hanging, this is hanging. And this type of continuation is no good for black. So, did it, okay, I heard you talking. Um, oh no, sorry, you're good. Uh, so queen f4, offering the queen trade. They can't really step the queen out of the way. So their two options are to take the queen or to interpose this pawn. And if black is gonna take the queen and go with this trade, knight takes, immediately hits e6 and c6. This weakness that we identified originally is now it's like accentuated with the queens off the board, which is kind of surprising to me. But um, so I guess for time's sake here, uh, we'll just look at the one kind of obvious move of what black playing e5, because it protects this pawn and hits this knight. But then now we have knight which is really nice. We have knight d5 as an option here, using the pin that was mentioned earlier in the position as well as something. And then in that position, black would not have rooks c to c8 because of check, winning the exchange. So some of the tactical kind of elements and problems with the position are showing up in these lines. Also, knight to e6 is totally in good position because at the end of the day, this, this c pawn is just going to fall and white's going to be having a bunch of initiative even if black ends up playing e takes d so i think this line is good this, i mean the, just putting it on the board something like this looks very very good for white so i am happy with this continuation here of push oops excuse me here um on queen takes i think it's almost refuted by knight takes so the other move that we need to consider is if we offer the queen take trade and they push the pawn to e5. And we're gonna take this pawn, forcing them to recapture. If, um, let's say they recapture with the pawn, then I think queen to e5, queen to e4, or queen to c4 are strong moves. e4, we're now attacking the c pawn yet again C, C5 is not possible because, again, this loose rook in the position is here. Um, they would probably play rook to C8, tying it all together. But black is very tied down in this position. 
We have three things attacking c6, they have three defending. We have two things attacking e e5, they have two defending. So any peace movement is gonna like result in a lost pawn. And also this is now an isolated pawn. So if we end up trading these trading down a lot, this may become a liability for black in the end game. So this continuation I think is fine for black for white as well. And even in this position, I don't know if this move is better than which move is better. I just I think that this is a good my evaluation is that this is fine or good for white. That's this position. So if after we take and say they take with the knight, if we just take down again, they clearly can't queen take because this trade drops the C pawn and we're up a healthy pawn. We have power on the C file. This is an isolated pawn. We're up a pawn. This is probably just completely winning. So that line is no good. Another line, and this actually does come from a game, which I think I could maybe show you, but I'm not going to bother. Um, after we take here, I think in the game played was takes. And I don't remember if in the game, but again, e4 and c4 are fine squares for the queen with the same idea that, you know, if I go here, you can't push because of takes. So something like this. And then, I mean, queen c4 is also a strong move because one of the ideas in this position is, you know, let's say we play queen c4. If king f8, then we could lift the rook to c3 and activate it along this way. We're still making progress in the position here. Um, if the king goes to the corner, then I think their king is just in the corner. If they have an isolated pawn, we have better activity. Um, if they play rook f7, I don't know. We can st we can still just like improve our things. So um, I think that this is a good continuation, and it was what was played in the game and was the correct answer, which I thought was a surprising to me to trade queens in such a position, but. If we use kind of the uh, planning positions ideas here, it's easier to find this move knowing that exchanges is one of the things we're looking for. So again, like just to reiterate over the, the model here is if you're given these kind of positional exercises and I went on a stream a long time ago, or a few months ago, it was like me and Seth Nordovich and uh, DM Hokey and we did some of these chess.com exercises by Silman on like these positional exercises and those, those are great ways to practice this um and you could probably we could if we had this we would probably be able to find some of these moves a lot faster so again the idea is first look at what your opponent has to do like what are their threats do they have any good ideas what are their pluses then the three kind of main categories to look at are looking for regroupings of your pieces looking to make exchanges or looking to make certain pawn moves and then you know you justify and choose a final solution and in this position, I chose the queen f4 move. And yeah, that Excellent. is my lecture for today. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm realizing for the audience, it must be kind of a lot to get so many lessons in one day because it's it's a little bit rapid fire. Like I, I don't know how many people's brains are set up to receive, you know, six or seven, you know, lessons in a single day. But we're just going to keep them coming. So thank you very much, Eric. It was an excellent lesson. Thank you. The viewer showcase continues. Oh, as always, I'm going to have to change the name correctly. But you can you can take it away, Dripman. You need no further Great. introduction than that you just Thanks, won David. the end game challenge. So go for it. Appreciate it. Uh, so my lesson today is going to be about two things. One, playing with confidence and feeling when you're entitled to a tactic. And two, once you start that tactical attack, staying principled and not rushing into it. I think I'm good at the first of these things, but the second of these things uh, I've had trouble with. And I actually played a game recently, training game that Kostya and I analyzed afterwards, where uh, this weakness I have kind of came into play. So it's been something I've been trying to work on. So here I have a game, Geller versus Portish, and I'm just gonna kind of run through the opening. The first move that's a little bit notable is queen d7. Uh, so I didn't analyze this with an engine at all. I didn't look at any sort of notes from someone else, but I checked the opening book and, and this is an uncommon move nowadays. Uh, and I think this game really shows why, because what's currently played is knight a5, really just trying to get this bishop 
off of this diagonal as quickly as possible. So kind of keep that in mind as a theme going forward. And the second Portish plays this queen d7 in accuracy, uh, Geller really jumps on this, opening up the center, d takes e5, and after takes back, uh, we see knight h5 kind of already starting an attack. Now, uh, black responds with queen e7. I think the most natural thing for a lot of people would say, uh, hey, like they're trying to attack, let's trade queens. And after something like knight takes f6, g takes f6, white actually has a very nice move here, which is bishop d1. I think the natural thing to do would be to recapture with the rook. But the problem is black wants to play knight e7 which would re reveal an attack on this pawn. But by keeping the rook here, we have this defended and we're fast enough now to play knight h4. And here, I think at a lot of the level that like I'm at and a lot of the viewers are at, you know, white has something here. White has, has successfully fought for the f5 square. But I think at the GM level, this is kind of just unacceptable to allow. Uh, Black's pieces can never essentially move for protecting this square, let's just make a ridiculous move like this. Because if you ever allow this knight to get to f5, you have kind of unstoppable pressure on this pawn. Because if you go to defend it, uh, this bishop comes in and you're going to lose f7. So that's that's why you can't just kind of do this like quick queen swap. So instead, going back to the game after knight h4, we have what I'm going to call a mistake, which is knight takes h5, kind of giving white what they want and bringing the queen in. Again, my guess is like, you can still defend this position somehow. Um, I didn't spend a ton of time trying to do it because I think the bigger critical moment is later. Uh, but to me, there's just no reason to allow this queen to come in. And especially this, this next move, knight a5. And so even if you, let's say you're in this position and you feel like there, there's not necessarily a tactic, it doesn't seem like right away because Black's pretty consolidated, but in my mind, Black has kind of committed some sins. They they took knight h5, bringing the queen in, and then they hopped their knight to the edge of the board. But if white were to just play a natural move, let's say bishop c2 retreating, this isn't quite enough because after just, again, some normal moves here, white's better, but they don't really have anything immediate. So I want people to feel this moment where knight a5 comes and white should say hey if i play bishop c2 i'm a little bit better but i i feel like i want to play confident and i'm entitled to more and like spend time here and open up your mind to more positions because i think where a lot of us are at in this ultimate sensei about the 1600 level when people talk about oh i can't feel tactics in a position a lot of times it needs to be beyond like, hey, like there are loose pieces that are undefended. There's maybe a fork. And, and we want to get into uh, maybe another level of thinking of like, hey, positionally, I deserve more. And I'm not saying I would ever find this move in a game, but Geller finds this amazing move, Bishop G5. Taking advantage of this pressure on F7 while it's still there. And the only thing you need to be able to calculate to play this move is that if you take you have knight g6, on one hand attacking this queen, but also you have this unstoppable mate threat. Oops. And so this double threat, if you see this, is enough to play bishop g5. But again, I'm not even saying that I would see this, but what I want people to take away is that mentally, in this position, you should be willing to calculate. So bishop g5, queen retreats over, and this is actually my favorite move of the game rook a d1 and this is what i need to work on and that i have talked with kosia about because if i'm in this position i'm like okay i got all these pieces pointing what are my candidate moves sack here sack here knight f5 but the problem is is this bishop here is providing very good defense and this simple principle of bringing in all your pieces into the attack leaves black with absolutely no choices because there are two options. Retreat the queen to a safe square, which completely undefends f7, or block the queen with the bishop, keeping defensive f7, 
which is what was played in the game. But now you've undefended this extremely critical diagonal. So in the midst of all of this hanging bishop g5, in the midst of this quasi-hanging bishop on b3, in the sense that once you lose it, this bishop, your attack is pretty much done for, Geller finds to me this amazing move, rook ad1, staying principled in the attack, deflecting this bishop from defense, and now he is able to finish the position very nicely. Bishop takes h6, takes, check, exploiting the pin, king f8. And now in this position, another nice quiet move, because again, uh, now, now this taking is a threat, and also this king wants to escape. So simply sliding this king over, sorry, sliding this queen over boxes the king in, making it impossible for the king to run. And it also comes with this threat of check, checkmate. So black's essentially in extremely big trouble here and it's completely dead. And after king g8, again, bringing more pieces into the attack with a quiet move, rook e3 with the idea of, hey, I'm just going to slide over and I'm going to win this game. And this is, I mean, Black can like give away their pieces to try to stop it, uh, but it, it's just going to be completely losing if not forced mate. So this is what I, I, the two moments of this game that are very important to me are after knight a5 saying, I am better here and I will not accept playing bishop c2 and going passive and only being slightly better and spending time to find some other move in the position. And then once you find a move like this, being able to follow it up precisely with rook ad1, not forgetting your principles. Because when I get into these situations, I immediately just try to start calculating all the things. I'm calculating this sack, I'm calculating this sack. I'm calculating knight f5, and I, I'm forgetting about this rook on a1. And just bringing this rook over, even if maybe black has, let's say this is a different position, black has some other sort of defense to either, you know, still cover this, still move the queen. To me, what's important to recognize is I'm not actually giving up any time. I'm not wasting any critical tempi here in my attack because black is really forced to respond to this. Uh, so this to me has like a very instructive game of uh, kind of interesting in the sense that I think it, it helped along some Roy Lopez theory and showing why this knight a5 needs to come very early in order to kick this bishop off the diagonal, but also these other attributes about how uh, you need to combine critical moments, fast attack, but then a slow build sometimes after that. Because I, I, like I said, I had a game practice game recently where I went too fast for the attack where my opponent couldn't move any pieces and I could have just tucked my king safely, slowly built and then done my whole plan. So I hope you all enjoyed this and got something out of it and looking forward to the matches after this. So have a good day, guys. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I am Ty Bruce Zimmerman, a.k.a. Chess Numbers, a.k.a. Bob Joe Jim on <laughs> chess.com. And today I'm going to talk about calculation and specifically not how to calculate. Uh, Seth already gave us, I think, a really good demonstration of that but rather why calculation is so important, even in spots where we might be tempted to think it's not necessary. So what happens to me, this is a weakness that I have, and I have a strong suspicion a lot of other players at my level share this weakness, is that I like to play on intuition. Um, I'm a pretty good calculator. We saw that hopefully if you watch me win the tactics challenge but i often just don't do it if a move seems conceptually unplayable or so it might be a move of my own and a resource i have that i dismiss or it might be a resource for our opponent that we miss but playing on intuition obviously gets us into a lot of trouble so what I'm going to be showing here is a position that uh, Matt showed me originally just as a positional instruction, because I'm also 
relatively weak at positional play, and that's something that we've been working a lot on. But he has also consistently, throughout all our lessons, done a really good job calling me out on those moments where I say a move looks good instead of giving a line. So we're going to look at this position where the positional concept it was supposed to teach me was something I basically lost track of because I discounted some moves. And this is a Capablanca game from Hastings 1919. The opening isn't really the point, but they played just this double Lopez, four knights game. Uh, Winter had white, Capablanca was black. Winter makes this trade, plays d3. Capablanca kicks the bishop, and this is our key position. Now, because this isn't a lesson on positional play, I will just spoil the point of the position, which is that white would love to play the d4 pawn break here. So the idea black needs to be looking at is c5 to stop d4. But what my intuition told me was that that must be unplayable because it creates this hole uh, for knight d5. And then you have the threat of knight takes f6 with the pin, and if g takes back, the king side is just getting too heavily weakened. So the danger is if you see an idea like that and dismiss c5 because of it, you'll miss out on what turns out to be the move Capablanca played, what turns out to be the best move. Um, there is a follow-up where my intuition gets even more aggressive about that because if you do force yourself to try to calculate, okay, what if I did play c4, c5 and white plays knight d5? What do I have? Is it so bad? There's really only two ways to parry the threat on f6 without having to take back with the g-pawn and just being in an awful position. One of them would be bishop e7, but that just proves to be way too passive that one's a pretty easy one to evaluate that it's not what we're going for if that's our best move c5 is something we have to reject the other option is g5 that breaks the pin but here my intuition when matt showed this to me was that that can't possibly work and i without calculating i just said no you can't play that because I'm a tactical player and I'm immediately seeing knight takes, pawn takes, bishop takes, and thinking this must be good for white. And that is the danger. The ultimate point here is that we have to avoid those that must be right situations and actually calculate. Now, because this is only a 10 minute lecture, I'm not gonna force people to calculate this position out. I'm gonna put the key lines on the board and just go through what you would see if you had the time to calculate. And then I'll go through how you could have seen that from the original position if you put the work in, but, and if you shoot down that voice in your intuition telling you to not consider this at all. So Capablanca did play C5 and Winter had the same intuition we, that I did, that probably some of you had looking at this as well, and went for the knight d5 line. And we already looked at, without putting it on the board, we looked at, for example, this, and it's just not enough. White would be happy here. So instead, Capablanca plays the move I thought he couldn't play, g5. And it is true in this position my intuition was telling me this is a disaster, and it is. This is one of those places the danger comes in where a couple ply down the road from the starting position, and it's easy to think that h takes g5 was forced, and this would be horrible. Now the situation on f6 is even worse than it was before. Um, I, this is also not a lesson on attacking. 
so I'm not going to spend too much time on exactly how white converts this, but this position is great for white. Uh, black can try something like bishop e7 to try to hold together, but after the trade and queen f3, now the king has to come up and white has this queen g3 move. This is absolutely good for, for white. This is, again, if this was inevitable, we wouldn't have played c5 originally. But here is the trick. H takes G5 wasn't forced. If, if, at, if When we play G5, if white thinks they have all of that and takes, there's a move that with this on the screen, you might see that you might not have seen on C5. So this is actually a spot where if you do force yourself to toss intuition aside and do the calculation, this is a spot where the steps method would help the calculation tremendously if you're able to pause in this moment, recognize that H takes G5 isn't forced, and then you might find this key intermezzo, knight takes D5, and bingo. Now, you, still room to calculate a little more because white does have a potential discovery on the queen, but the knight can't check. So there's not a great way to make use of it since the knight's also pinned to an undefended bishop. So they could try retreating, defending the bishop, but then you just retreat, black is one apiece, and that's enough to make up for the weaknesses on the king side. Or if they tried something, some more aggressive desperado like this, you can grab the bishop, they take the rook, and you can just save your knight. That knight's never getting out. You're going to be up a piece again. So if you calculate this position carefully and you spot this knight takes d5 intermezzo, you are able to come to the conclusion that g5 is playable. Uh, then you have to look at what will white play instead of knight takes, and you might find the game continuation um, once you have, once you're hitting this bishop, if they just retreat, you get the real point of this exercise positionally, which is that that bishop is, while still technically on the board, basically lost because it's locked in a prison by those pawns. This is the positional point that this game is more famous for. This is what Matt was trying to teach me. Um, it is relevant and important, and it, and I will show you how the game ends very quickly in a moment, but for me, I got stuck on that knight takes g5, thinking this was impossible, missing the key because I didn't take the time to calculate the position enough. And without calculating, I would have never thought c5 was playable in the original position. So the forced move here is knight takes f, or not forced, but the game continuation is knight takes f6 and kappa takes back with the queen, bishop runs away and is entombed forever. Capablanca decides to trade into essentially a piece up end game and goes on to convert this very smoothly. F6 locks in the position. Um, this is why it's a classic game. This is outside the scope though of my point. I just really want to emphasize this situation that I run into so often in my own games where I think a move looks bad, so I don't look at it further. And it's so important that we calculate. So I'm good at calculation because of my, on, on the tactical side, I know to calculate my tactical lines, but what I've been really learning more about as I work on positional play with Matt is how important calculation is to strategic play as well. We saw this a little bit in Eric's lesson also. He was showing us a strategic position, uh, but he had to calculate a bunch of lines and we worked through to see why that queen trade that he proposed made sense. So calculation isn't just for tactics, it's for strategy too. And we always have to check our intuition. Uh, real quick, the game was just pretty straightforward. None of this is the point, but you can see Winter was never able to free the bishop and eventually gave up playing basically down a piece. So back to our 
original posi position. If we spot that calculation, and it's not the hardest calculation ever. Um, it's a couple a couple moves deep with a few key lines. But if you really, I think I know that I'm able to calculate a line like c5, knight d5, g5, g5, knight takes g5, knight takes d5. That's five moves. That's a calculation I'm capable of. But I might not do it if I'm not forcing myself to calculate when it's necessary. So I, it's just a really important takeaway here. If you spot the C5 idea in the first place and are looking at this positional idea of stopping D4, don't reject it because a move looks wrong. Find out if a move is actually wrong. And if the calculation piece is hard for you, the calculation that allows you to play positionally, then you work on calculation too, and we all need to always work on calculation, both for our strategic play and for our tactical play. But I hope this position where it's not super complicated if you take the time to do it, but it's for me incredibly non-intuitive, and I suspect for a lot of other people out there too, I hope this really drives home why calculation is so important, perhaps even more so than we already give it credit for. All right. Thank you, Ty. OK, cool. Thank you, David. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so the first thing I learned is that you kind of want to go, when you're picking the candidate moves, um, you know, I guess each position might have more than others, some less. But you pick them, and it's best to go with the most obvious ones first, the easiest ones to calculate. That way, if they're wrong, <clears throat> you can just move on quickly. Um, but also, I guess another important thing is kind of pick the three, but skim through them quickly. Like, don't go too far with it. You know what I mean? Oh, that I know way. what you mean. That's what I've been working on this past year myself. Yeah. I, <laughs> she'll tell me. Anybody can tell me that. I'm in La La Land. I'll just <laughs> go in forever. But it's important to, like, yeah, pick the three that makes the most sense. And then from there, um, try the, the the easiest one to figure out, and that way you can exempt it quickly if um, if it's not a good move. And so I, you know, it took me a long time to even get used to that. Like you said, you're working on that, and um, she kept telling me, "Will you stop doing that?" Or what is your? Can I was like, "I don't know." So it's it's really <clears throat> important to kind of have it like your mind, I guess, focused and organized that way. Mm -hmm. At least for me, because that's my weakness. I, I just end up all over the place. And so, yeah, uh, this position, uh, we kind of went over, you want to look for checks, captures, and threats. You know, checks first. And then um, <clears throat> if, if I guess, if, uh, if yeah, if, if there's no checks, then you then look for um, potentially a capture. And then if not, a really strong threat. So here we just start with, you know, rook check seems to be the only one you can do. So the first thing I did was rook check. And it's important to note that every move that you select for them needs to be the most forceful one. Um, so first, you, you know, you're looking at two ways it can capture you. So you just figure, <clears throat> go through the F7 pawn first. I, I, I suppose you can just pick one. I just picked one. That made the most sense because um, this one opens up the line for the queen. So if rook captures, and if f7 captures, queen check, and then king f8, bishop e7 check, king g8, queen. E8 check. King, and again, this is all, uh, I guess I'm not explaining each move because it's like forced. I don't know if, I mean, I, I assume you guys know that. <laughs> but yeah, so then King H7. And here's, here's, the, here's where it was getting really tough. 
this was getting really tough for me because I could not, you know, you run into this problem where <clears throat> you check with the bishop and then it just captures. And so it, it took me like 20, 30 minutes she just would not give me a hint. I was like, "Come on!" <laughs> so, anyhow, it's it's this is a this is a the reason why it's hard is because you actually, um, oh my gosh, I forgot, I forgot the line. No, I didn't. <laughs> Queen's here. Okay, um, shoot, I'm gonna have to run it through it again. See, it's hard, guys. Captures. Yeah. Check. 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 Okay. Oof. And then um oh, queen check. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because then it gets captured by the queen. Ooh. Dang. I I I ha I I totally. Okay. Oh, that, I got it. Sasha makes you work hard. Uh, she did. She was not letting me let up. I was like, is it, are you sure this is fair? I've never <laughs> done this before. But it really, man, I was so tired of the lesson. It just really, um, but I, I appreciate that. It really um, made me work hard for uh, the answer. And I mean, I had it prepared. I guess I'm just kind of maybe nervous. <laughs> okay. I guess. Um, oh, she's going to hate me for not knowing. <laughs> Wow, she's really intense. You're afraid she's gonna hate you? <laughs> no, but this is this is uh I should know it. My goodness. David, do you, I bet you already know it too. You're just looking at it. I have figured it out, but it took me a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you want do you do you want me to to help you through it a little yeah. bit it gets it yeah. gets to your thing about candidate moves you actually need to find an unusual candidate move after bishop e7 check king to g8 um like queen e8 queen h5 is kind of like the obvious approach but there's a black queen on c5 covering h5 you've got good visualization visualization to see that so you need to stop in the position after bishop e7 king g8 and look for other candidate moves for white in that position Right, because it doesn't work. Other than queen e8, king h7. And something that I'll do a lot is I'll just keep going. Queen e8, king h7, queen e8, king h7, even though it doesn't work. And I won't like get it through my head like this thing doesn't work. Add a new She's, idea. Don't just keep... Yeah, you have no idea. She's going to yell at me because we literally went... <laughs> She's going to be like... Die. She was trying to teach me to stop, like you said. And I just did it again. Uh-huh. <laughs> literally the same exact move. Yeah yeah wow yeah chess is hard i gotta say um yeah yeah so it's a it, so you said there's a bishop pin right uh yeah so i said after you go uh bishop e7 check king to g8 you could look for mm -hmm. other moves i didn't say it would be a bishop pin but uh, um, oh, oh oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. It, but there is what well, but it is a bishop move um yeah oh it's um it's uh oh it's a bishop check i think yes okay let me start that over i think sasha in chat said that you can move pieces if you want oh okay <laughs> <laughs> i think you've been given permission man that does help <laughs> okay actually um i believe if you do bishop check Maybe it's not bishop check actually. Um, is it? No, nope. no, nope. It's not. It's not. Hang but on. that's a, that's a good extra candidate move to look at bishop h five check before the queen check. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now let's go in here. Yep, here and now look for a new candidate yeah. move here other than queen e eight. Yeah, totally. I don't. I don't know why. I'm drawing a blank. Um, oh, yeah, Bishop F six. Yeah, yeah, fantastic that, move. That is is a hard move to find. Very hard to look for. It's like three yeah. moves ahead, and you're like down two rooks, and then you have to play a move that's not check. 
that is a hard one to find, especially since you moved the bishop there in the first place to go backwards. You know, it's yep. I always have a hard time, especially if you knew like you move your knight out and then certain situations, you got to move it right back home. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that's so tough. That's not the same situation, but in some ways, I don't know, it just slips my mind. Um, yeah, that's she, so I, that's uh, kind of ingrained in my head how hard it is. And here's a prime example of how I don't remember. And also the fact that when you sacrifice your rook, you have to really know all that before you do it. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's, you don't just mm, check, you know, that's, uh, that's the stress, the importance of uh, calculating, you know, I, yeah. I, I don't know how else to say it. it's, um, you need For a, a weird you need a weird mix in this problem of both like persistent stubbornness but also flexibility of thought. Like you need to be persistent enough to keep looking for a way to make it work after queen e8 check doesn't work, but flexible enough to stop looking at queen e8 <laughs> and try and find a different you know, idea. No, that's what she said that. Yeah. And it's going to take me some time to uh, you know apply it in the game and then you know I'm going to hear her voice be like die stop stop calculating that move it doesn't work. You know, yeah. eventually, but um, she really stressed that. So yeah, that's that was the first one she gave me, and wow, yeah. wow. I was toasted. Well, I can tell you, <laughs> I can tell you, she expects a lot out of you if she's giving you a puzzle like this. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, but you know, she knows I love the challenge, and I wouldn't want it any other way. So yeah, it's been really great with her. Awesome. So and also, I I gotta thank you for the opportunity to be on here. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. Yeah. Uh man, that's all I got prepared. Cool. That's great. That's great. Everybody's <laughs> everybody's probably ready to play as well. All right. So, so um how does Oh, that... sorry, sorry, sorry. She's going to hate me too. I'm what? scared. It's all caps. What, what this was not a puzzle. It was a calculation task. I I correct myself before I get in trouble. <laughs>